In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It is a marvelous joy and privilege for me to be here with all of you today to be a part of the baptisms of so many little ones and older ones as well and to be the bishop who has the privilege of confirming this class of 37. What a great gift it is for me to be here. What a joy it is because the Holy Spirit soars in this place. The Holy Spirit whom we celebrate today on this feast of Pentecost the Spirit soars as you share gifts in this place, gifts of music, gifts of reading, and of all of the pieces that it takes to make worship happen. You share your financial resources with the wider diocese through the pledge that you make and keep. Thank you. The Spirit soars as women gather in this place, women from across the city, the commonwealth, the nation, and even from other parts of the world in the annual woman spirit. The Spirit soars as you share this space with the wider diocesan community, as you did in the walkabouts before I was elected Bishop Suffragan, in the Episcopal Music Series, the Shrinemont Camp staff reunion that took place here last winter, and on so many other occasions. Thank you for that. I honor and thank you for all of your faithfulness and for the partnership that we share in Christ's mission. And I'm blessed to be among you again, especially because this time I get to be with you standing on both feet. Well, a couple of winters ago, I was in the airport in Los Angeles. I was attempting to fly back to Richmond after a conference there. It was a gorgeous, warm Southern California day, but ice storms were hitting all across the South on that same day, including Dallas-Fort Worth, the airport that I was scheduled to fly through. Well, many of you know that experience of being stuck in an airport. It was so incongruous because it was such a warm day and it was ice storms that were preventing us from flying. Well, lines kept getting longer, tempers kept getting higher. There were no seats left because the airport was so crowded with people who were waiting news for when they might get to their destinations. Frustration just kept increasing in the face of uncertainty. And then suddenly, a man in a TSA uniform stepped out from behind the desk and he sang, I used to think that I could not go on. And another man stepped out and sang, and life was nothing but an awful song. <laughs> and another man stepped out, but now I know the meaning of true love. And a fourth, I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. And by then, an entire chorus of men and women dressed in TSA uniforms <laughs> began the chorus, I believe I can fly. <laughs> of course, all of us did what you just did. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Take my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. See me running through that open door. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. The chaos of that unexpected and delightful moment shaped itself into glorious order 
travelers in the airport from many parts of the world who spoke different languages, who were from a variety of cultures and races and ethnicities, all of us came together in that shared experience. Most of us were infused with joy, with hope, and with strength for the long journey that was yet ahead. And we started singing along, and even dancing, and laughing, and getting to know one another. It changed the whole mood. And I've often wondered, do they do that every time there are delays? <laughs> because it works. Well, I imagine that the first Pentecost was something like that. In the midst of an ordinary day, the extraordinary, the unexpected broke in. Followers of Jesus, 120 of them, men and women, were all gathered together. It was 10 days after Jesus had ascended into heaven. And there they were trying to figure out how to go on now that Jesus was no longer with them in flesh and blood and bones. They were trying to figure out what it meant to be followers of Jesus when he wasn't there physically. And they were trying to figure out what the new normal might be. And suddenly the Holy Spirit crashed in on them unexpectedly, completely, powerfully. Now never mind that Jesus had told them that he was going to send his spirit to them. They didn't remember that promise. It didn't make much sense to them. So its fulfillment caught them off guard without warning, like a flash mob in an airport. It surprised them. The coming of the Holy Spirit surprised them first with a sound of the rush of a mighty wind. And then it came as a flash of fire. And then as a, caco a, a cacophony of words, as Jesus' friends began to proclaim God's message in languages that they didn't know before and probably never spoke again. The chaos of noises shaped itself into a glorious order. People from many parts of the world, many walks of life, were brought together by a shared experience. Despite the differences in language, in race, in nation and culture, they all heard the good news proclaimed in ways that they could understand. The living, breathing, burning, scorching Holy Spirit came to Jesus' friends and they were filled to overflowing, filled with power, with hope, and with joy to do at last what Jesus had been training them up to do all along, which was to go out into the world and serve in his name, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. I believe they could soar, see them running out that open door. I believe they could fly that day. They did fly that day because the Spirit came to Jesus' friends and they came to know more than ever before the meaning of true love. They learned how to lean on those everlasting arms and they did fly. The living, breathing, burning, scorching power of the Holy Spirit came also to strangers that day, strangers who had never heard of Jesus and they were amazed too. Some of them thought, as we heard in the reading, that it was a drunken frenzy. But others were changed forever 
infused with a spirit who gave them new hope and new life. And they too came to know the meaning of true love. They too learned to lean on those everlasting arms. They too began to fly. Because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, is not only for the followers and friends of Jesus who were gathered in the, that place on that day. It was also for the strangers and the outsiders and the foreigners who would never enter that place where the disciples were gathered. In the same way, the Pentecost moment, the coming of the Holy Spirit is not for us alone. It's not for the church alone. God sent the invigorating, refining, transforming power of the Spirit for the sake of the world, for the sake of other people, for the sake as much for people who will never set foot in our churches as for the sake of those who do. God empowers us with the Spirit so that we can go out through those doors to serve the world in Christ's name and to connect with the others out there for whom the Spirit also came. You in this congregation have been set on fire by the Spirit to make those connections by the power of the Spirit, you welcome into this place and provide shelter, meals, and love for neighbors in Richmond who would otherwise have no place, no safe place to spend the night. And you work with other organizations to prevent homelessness. You soar in the Spirit as you connect with children here in this place in the Peter Paul Development Center, in the Anna Julia Cooper School, and in so many other ways. The Spirit soars as you go out to be doers of the Word, taking love and hope with you to Haiti, Honduras, Sudan, and other places abroad. As you send even your teens and younger children out, to do missions of love and service. The Spirit empowers you in far too many ways for me to name if we're going to end this service in time for the next one to begin. The Spirit soars among you, continuing to shape you. You're not perfect. And I don't say that because I know your imperfections, but because we're all human beings. And because the church is a godly and yet not yet complete human institution. So we all have our growing edges. We all have those ways that the Spirit is continuing to push us and prod us and whack us up the side of the head and be utterly, utterly annoying to us as the Spirit tries to shape us more and more into whom we are called to be. But even in the midst of imperfections and growing edges and the ways that you still have before you, the new ways in which the Spirit will shape you, even in the midst of all of that, I know you know the meaning of true love. You're leaning on the everlasting arms because I believe you can fly. I believe you can touch the sky. You think about it every night and day. Take your wings and fly away. I believe you can soar. I'll see you running out that open door. I believe you can fly. In God's name you can fly. In the spirit you'll fly.